Hello, I'm Lisa Ling, and welcome to The Road to a Vaccine, a weekly exploration of the COVID-19 crisis and the global community's efforts to develop a vaccine against the disease. As you all well know, we are in a period of deep reflection here in America when it comes to race. This country has been engulfed in protests and even violence in recent days, this on top of the deadly pandemic that has disproportionately affected Black America. So before we start the show today, I just want to take a moment to remember the Black lives lost in this country over the last few months. And we couldn't do this show today without addressing the confluence of issues that our Black community in America is facing. So I want to welcome back to the show Dr. Cato Lorenzen from the University of Connecticut School of Medicine to discuss his thoughts on what's been happening. Dr. Lorenzen, Welcome back to the show. You know, you'd have to be hiding under a rock to not know how institutionalized, institutionalized racism has affected the lives of Black Americans in this country and for generations. You say that racism is a public health issue. Can you tell us about your research on the impact of all this stress on the Black community? Well, uh, first of all, thank you uh, very much for having me, uh, having me back again. Um, obviously, this is a stressful time for the black community, a stressful time for the entire community. But I, I think it's also very, very clear that um, that that we are living in a time where it's, it's very clear in terms of the effects, what the effects are of, of, of racism in this country. In many ways, blacks in America are experiencing a double pandemic uh, with the disease of racism. Actually, Albert Einstein called it a, a disease. Um, and also the um, also the, the obviously the pandemic that's taking place with COVID-19. Uh, people have asked me what's going on in the black community. Obviously, there's anguish, there's there's pain, but it's also something. This is something that's not new. This has been something that has uh, been going on that we've been talking about uh, for a very long you know, period of time. Um, uh, to those uh, in the white community. Um, these areas, the, these these occurrences are not subtle. They're not nuanced, um, and I think it's you know very very clear um, the, the effects of of racism uh, in our society. Um, but those effects are are really broad based. We see this in policing, uh, but we see this in really all aspects of the lives of of, uh, of black people. I was reading about some of the policies that we've had in terms of even uh, housing, first starting with redlining that took place in terms of uh, the inability to be able to, you know, provide housing loans to be able to uh, to build a home and you know build a future, and then the more modern occurrences just in the last few years of reverse redlining. Well, if you want a loan, we'll give you a loan, but it's going to be a highly predatory loan that will that will uh, take your fortunes away. Um, leading to problems in public housing, poverty, et cetera. So these issues are broad based. They're, they're not nuanced. Um, as a former prophet once said, if you don't know now, you know, um, it's, uh, it's really is something that it's, uh, that we have to tackle, uh, in America. Uh, and I want to make it very, very clear that uh, I am a black American, but this is an American problem that has to be tackled by all. Uh, and Dr. Lenson, as a, as a medical doctor who has spent so much of your career studying these issues, what would you say can be done to improve the health of our Black American community uh, that has gotten hit so hard by COVID? Well, I think we have to do some things uh, uh, better. Uh, first of all, we have to, uh, you know, very aggressively move to the next level in terms of what we're doing in terms of COVID testing. We're still way behind in terms of uh, in terms of testing. We have to do a better job in terms of tracer technology and uh, and tracer work. We have to have appropriate medical care, and of course, I've advocated for the fact that we should not wait for as some of the instructions say if your if your lips are blue, come to the hospital. We should be providing medical care early on um, in communities with uh, with small either pop-up tent or small uh, community-based uh, areas for, for individuals to go to be treated early. Uh, I spoke about the experience in Shenzhen, China, where uh, they 
performed early interventions where they brought people in as soon as they were uh, found to be COVID-19 positive, gave them supportive care. None went on ven ventilators. None died in the in the study that, that was in the Journal of Infectious Diseases. That's what we need to do in the community. But then we have to address the the root causes of uh, that uh, that are contributing to the to the greater uh, numbers of, of blacks uh, 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 succumbing to to COVID-19. And those root causes are really rooted in the areas of racism, and that that we can see in this country. It's what I talked about. We published the first paper on COVID-19 in Blacks, the first referee paper showing data in this area. We spoke about the fact that racism and discrimination are at the root and the heart of all the things that we're seeing. I talked about housing, uh, access to health care, quality of health care in terms of unconscious bias by physicians. All of these uh, come together and figure into uh, what's, what's, uh, what's happening with Blacks in America, and we need to address this aggressively. That's right. And there's never been a better time to address these issues than right now, as it is on the forefront of everyone's minds. Now, I'm sure you've seen the movements that have sprung up all over the world demanding systemic change. Major multinational corporations are taking stands. Um, as a Black American man, you are part of the demographic most affected by this confluence of events. You've lived through the civil rights era. I, I just have to ask you how you're feeling about everything and whether you think that this is a transformational moment. Well, I think that um, that this in many ways can be. You know, you know Fannie Lou Hamer once said, uh, uh, we're sick and tired and we're sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I think that um, many people, black and white in the country are feeling that way. But you know, um, uh, she also said, and it's a less famous phrase, um, we've been waiting all our lives for change. Um, and we're now tired of waiting. And so I, I hope that uh, Americans, not just black Americans, but all Americans now stop and say enough is enough and we have to make the types of changes that will take place to make this country better. And do you think that this is a, a, a transformational moment? I mean, given the things that are happening, the protests and 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 um, the fact that it seems like we've, we're, we're sort of galvanized right now, do you think this is that moment? Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping it is. And I think that uh, because I think all around the country, really all, as you said, all around the world is being recognized. And I, again, I think that um, uh, protests um, should show dissent, and uh, it's important. That's why protests are there. And uh, uh, some of the areas of violence that we're seeing, we're now learning um, that are are maybe due actually to uh, white supremacists who have actually contributed to this through you know, trying to foment uh, anger, anger and violence in terms of a number of these different uh, these, these uh, protests. Uh, interesting, I don't like to use the term white supremacist. It should be white racist instead of supremacist. Not that they feel that they are better. They feel that others are are, are not as good and that they're better. So uh, I think it, it really is white racist instead of white supremacist. But the, the fact is that we're learning um, on a daily basis uh, their contribution uh, to fomenting violence and, and, and in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, what's going on. Um, but I think that uh, dissent is important uh, to be able to um, to be able to have uh, peaceful dissent is important in, in terms of being able being able to have change, and I'm hoping that change will come. Dr. Cato Lorenzen, thank you so much for joining us today, and thank you for giving us so much to think about. Thank you. Now, it's so important to acknowledge that during this pandemic, there have been many public demonstrations around the world, and hex health ex experts worry that events like these could set off a second wave of COVID infections because people are in such close proximity to one another, and testing centers uh, have been forced to close in many cases. So we'll be keeping an eye on the situation for now, but here's a quick snapshot of where the pandemic is today. There are 188 countries affected. 6.2 million cases, over 370,000 deaths, 10 candidate vaccines in clinical evaluation, and 121 candidate vaccines in preclinical evaluation. 
The bottom line is this story is still evolving. Now, this was originally meant to be our last episode, but we are extending the series so we can continue to follow the road to a vaccine. My biggest takeaway, talking to the experts we've had on so far, is that COVID is serious. It's global and it's constantly evolving. We have to rely on science. Now, remember, if you have any questions, please put them in the comment section and we will try to get them answered during the show. Today, we have two famed virus hunters who've spent the last 30 years in hot zones chasing diseases. They are good friends and now they're both battling COVID, one on the verge of developing a vaccine and one as a patient. But first, we have David Miliband. He's a former foreign secretary of the UK and currently president and CEO of the International uh, Rescue Committee, the IRC. He's been overseeing humanitarian relief offer operations in more than 40 war-affected countries and refugee assistance programs in over 20 cities across the US. David has spent his career addressing issues of racism and displacement around the global community. And so his perspective on this is as timely as ever. David, thank you so much for joining us today. As you just heard, Dr. Lorenzen and I were just talking about the challenges facing certain communities in our country. I know you've seen similar systemic issues around the globe. I mean, these issues that we've been experiencing here are not just isolated to America, are they? Good to be with you. The International Rescue Committee has a long partnership with uh, Johnson Johnson, and so it's nice to be able to have this uh, conversation uh, to take forward our understanding of each other's perspectives. We're an international humanitarian organization, as you say, and we see every day through our 13,000 employees, 17,000 auxiliary workers in 200 field sites in war-torn countries, that it's the holes in the global safety net that imperil life and livelihoods, just as within the United States, it's holes in the domestic safety net that imperil lives and livelihoods. Uh, we work in places where the underlying health conditions of the population are very weak. Uh, 18 million children under the age of five suffer from acute malnutrition in the fragile and conflict states that we focus on. And these are also countries where the, um, the health systems are very weak indeed. Uh, that can be measured, for example, by the number of ventilators. Yemen, uh, the world's largest humanitarian crisis in many ways, 18 million people dependent on humanitarian aid, has only four ventilators for the whole country. And uh, you can see there that if people get ill, uh, they are in grave danger. Obviously, we're also concerned that the conditions for large numbers of people uh, to get the illness are very grave. The population density, uh, 3 billion people around the world without running water in their own home, and so difficulties of uh, doing basic hygiene and a very weak testing system, just to take the Yemen example again, 31 tests per million of population compared to about 40,000 in the United States. So the conditions are ripe for those holes in the global safety net to become very serious indeed. And our great fear is that the disease is marching. It's marching, uh, first of all, from China to Europe, then from Europe to the US, then from the US down to uh, Latin America, where we're seeing the most exponential growth at the moment. But today we've had the first death in Cox's Bazar, the million person refugee camp in Bangladesh, where there are people from Myanmar. And our great fear is that in countries where the underlying health infrastructure is very weak indeed, we are weeks away from the disease taking a similar course to that which it has taken in Europe, North America, and now Latin America. Yeah, these are things that, that, that we in the West aren't hearing about as states start to open up more. Now, the IRC has estimated that we are at risk of up to a billion coronavirus cases and 1.5 to 3 million deaths in fragile countries. As I said, it just it doesn't seem like we are hearing about, uh, the, about any of this really in, 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 in the press. So can you Give us an assessment of what's been happening in, in these regions right now, and are there particular areas that you are most concerned about? Let me first of all put into context or explain those numbers. We took the Imperial College London uh, modeling uh, of the reproduction of the virus combined with the World Health Organization, and we plugged in numbers about populations at risk in the 34 countries that we work in. And that's where we came to the number of 500 million to a billion potential cases, one and a half million to three million uh, deaths. Now, actually, the death toll we'd estimated 
just using the basic number of Chinese levels of healthcare. And of course, in most of the places that we work, South Sudan, inside Syria, we're way below um, levels of Chinese levels of, of healthcare. But as yet, the disease has not yet uh, run rampant. We are, though, conscious that there are now 100,000 new cases a day and three to 4,000 deaths a day being recorded. So the numbers are really quite striking, especially the number of cases, uh, which we see feeding through into the number of serious illnesses and then deaths. In terms of the places that we're especially worried about, it obviously speaks to the mixture of underlying health conditions, weak health infrastructure, political meltdown, and economic strife. So we're very worried about Northeast Nigeria. Uh, we are very uh, concerned about Yemen, as I mentioned. We are desperately worried about uh, Bangladesh because of the million Rohingya uh, that are uh, there. Um, so those are, we're worried about Iraq because of the uh, fall in the oil price is obviously intersected with the pandemic. And so creates very grave concerns, uh, very large numbers of people in uh, camps, uh, internal displacement camps there. So those are the kind of places that we are especially worried about. I don't want us to forget, though, countries like Burkina Faso, countries like the Central African Republic, countries that are too often forgotten, but where millions of people are absolutely on the precipice and it doesn't take much to push them off. And so whether it be on the economic side or on the health side, we see, you referred earlier to a double pandemic, or I think maybe the professor referred to a double pandemic. We see a double emergency, a health emergency, but also a social and economic emergency, and they need to be tackled. I'm afraid at the moment, the global response has been utterly feeble. Uh, countries are focused on their own population, which is, of course, their own responsibility, first responsibility. But this is a disease of the connected world, and it needs a global response in the same way that after the 2008 financial crisis, the G20 was created for a global economic response. Um, in some ways, after 9-11, there was a global response on the uh, terrorism front. Uh, the myopia that says that governments just dealing with their own citizens is enough is really a serious concern. Social distancing has become sort of a mantra for us in trying to prevent the contraction of COVID. How difficult is social distancing in the parts of the world that you are focused on? Indeed, with one proviso, which is that many of the people that we are helping are spending most of their lives in the open air. They're not in offices. They're not in uh, even in buildings. And so actually... Uh, the data suggests that the best defense against the disease is to be outside. And I don't want to be frivolous about this uh, at all, but I have to tell you the honest picture that the demography of the populations we serve with a lot of young people and the fact that most of them are outside for a lot of the time gives some defense. Uh, now, uh, that's not to say that your question isn't very uh, appropriate. Social distancing in tightly bound conditions, three and a half million people squeezed into the northwest of Syria, for example, a million people, I mentioned refugees, in the uh, refugee camp in Bangladesh. Social distancing is practically impossible. That means that we have to focus on two or three other things. One, mask wearing matters, and that takes uh, a second thing, which is addressing fake news. I mean, it's really important that we have the credibility. We, we hire locally the 13,000 employees, 17,000 auxiliary workers I mentioned are locally hired to have credibility with the local population. But frankly, it's a battle to get the truth out. Thirdly, testing, 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 as the World Health Organization said. We don't have the facilities for high-grade testing of COVID itself, but we can test for fever. And although fever catches malaria as well as COVID, there's no excuse not to be testing for fever. And then critically building the isolation centers. I was just hearing this morning about 250-bed isolation centers we've built in Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. The testing for fever and then the isolation is some kind of defense. And then it depends on getting the primary healthcare system to save those who are savable. You mentioned four ventilators for a country of 18 million in Yemen. Um, I know that there are uh, a similar number for a population of 11 million in, in South Sudan. Is there a plan to get desperately needed equipment uh, and, and PPE to this part of the world? No, and actually um, a global drive to send ventilators to South Sudan or Yemen would not actually net save lives. What we need to do is get the testing in place, get the primary care in place, get the communication um, in place, because that's how we're going to save the most lives. I don't want to be cruel about it. Supply. 
David, are you still there? With the Syrian government with its Russian ally. Yeah, I, I'm speaking. Can you hear me? Sorry, I had I, you, you dropped out for a minute, but go ahead a, a second. Yeah, it, it won't it just getting the ventilators won't get over the problem of conflict, which bombs health centers. So our um, very clear focus is that it needs to be on the basics. Now, I, you mentioned PPE kit, which is a great point. I, I'm really proud that as a humanitarian organization, we were ordering PPE kit, I heard from our team in Bangladesh, on the 8th of February, because our emergency systems flagged this as a grave, real, and present danger to the populations that we uh, serve. But there's need for more. And that's where the kind of public-private partnership that I know uh, you, you and your organization stand for, or at least Johnson Johnson stand for, is really important. Partnership of NGOs and the private sector is especially important when governments are in retreat. And sad to say, too many governments are in retreat at the moment. I have a question from a viewer who's watching us uh, on LinkedIn, and she asks, why is it so difficult to evaluate the intensity of COVID globally? Question, I think the simple answer is that because there isn't enough testing being done. Uh, the figure I gave for Yemen, 31 tests per million of population. Nigeria, the largest country in Africa, the last figures I saw, 165 tests per million of population. That's what yields the infection rates of 24, 26, 30 percent. And what that tells you is you're not testing enough people. And so unless we can get the testing capacity sorted out, and you've seen the problems even in the U.S. where they've uh, made a mangle of the testing system, getting a global testing system uh, regime in place is the biggest blocker at the moment on tracking the disease. It's almost like we're fighting the disease with a blindfold on. Uh, there's a fog because there isn't proper uh, data. What we uh, no, though, is first of all, the disease does have great virulence. It can spread easily. Secondly, we're not yet being overwhelmed in our health centers. And it's important to say that we have 13,000 community health workers around the world. Uh, then we're not yet being overwhelmed. And I want to say that there's still time uh, to make a difference. But testing, testing, testing is the only way to understand the spread of the disease. I want to talk about those community healthcare workers because in so many parts of the developing world, there is such a lack of access to hospitals and resources. So can you explain who these healthcare workers are, what they do, and how we can support them? So interesting to me because in the uh, so-called advanced industrialized countries, uh, we often hear the phrase hard to reach people. People talk about public services and hard to reach people. Actually, it's the services that are hard to reach. And so what we have done is take that notion that actually it's the hospital or the health center that's hard to reach, not the people that's hard to reach, and inverted it and said our obligation is to take services to people rather than expect people to get to services. If you're a woman in South Sudan, you've got five or six kids, and most of them are probably quite young. You may have to walk three hours to get to a health center. Far, far better to invest in co these community health workers. You ask Lisa very rightly, who are they? They're just ordinary people. They may have no training. They may be illiterate or innumerate. But we've found you can train them to do important tasks. We know that community case management for diseases like uh, malaria, for diseases, um, we would argue, like malnutrition, which needs a community-based solution, for women's health care, maternal and women's reproductive health care. There's enormous scope for ordinary people who are not trained as doctors and nurses but can be trained to do basic tasks of diagnosis and provision. In the malnutrition case, we've actually done randomized control trials in Kenya and in South Sudan of how community health workers can diagnose malnutrition as well as doctors and nurses with a simple uh, upper arm circumference tape with no letters and no numbers, just colors to make it sure that it's easily accessible. And then we've also shown how they can prescribe certain amounts of plumpy nut of uh, IUTF to make sure that we address the disease properly. So these are ordinary people who have the capacity to do extraordinary things if properly supported. That's what we believe is the future of healthcare. Before we get telemedicine in the places that we work, we're gonna get community health workers. Incredible. Now, how will this have a long-term impact on, on things outside of the, 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 the healthcare um, issue, like things like education, for example? What will be the impact on on children, on women, and what can be done to address those issues? We're, we're, we're an agency that um, isn't just a health agency. 40% of our work is health, but 20% is education, another 20% is employment and livelihoods, another 20% is protection of vulnerable groups. And so when COVID struck, our fundamental operating model, which was to bring people together, 
gets hit because no longer can we bring people together. We've gone through, and we're going through at the moment, a really intensive program of program adaptation for no-touch health services, for remote education, for remote protection services. Uh, we, we use radio, for example, for uh, education. Uh, we've developing ways, and we've got a long way to go still, so there's room for public-private partnership on this too. Program adaptation is going to be the name of the game. And actually, this could drive the digital revolution into the places that we work. I've been in the humanitarian sector for six years. As you said, before that, I was in government as a foreign minister. Um, I have recognized that this sector, this humanitarian sector, hasn't yet felt the impact of the digital revolution. And in some ways, the COVID crisis is forcing the pace. And that may actually net be a silver lining of this crisis. David, give us a, a way to help you. I mean, you're, you are working to improve the lives and help the most vulnerable people. Tell us right now to the people who are watching how we can help your efforts at IRC. Please visit the International Rescue Committee website, rescue.org, uh, which is in a number of languages and will allow you to see what we're seeing. Our staff and our clients speak through that website. Obviously, I'm British, so I don't like talking about money, but I've lived in New York for six years. So if you can donate, please donate. We'd love to have your support because I'm afraid in this crisis, uh, the governments are frozen in the headlights. They're not giving the money, and so we're reliant on our private uh, partners to do so. I'd also say work with us. Uh, ideas sharing between NGOs and the private sector is going to be the name of the game at a time when governments are putting up walls. We need to be building the bridges that allow us to solve problems. And I feel that we're building in the International Rescue Committee an NGO that is oriented around solutions rather than suffering. And that speaks to our history. Just a final point to link to what Professor Lawrenson said. He mentioned Albert Einstein and how Albert Einstein saw the fight against racism as core to his role as a refugee. And as a refugee in New York, Albert Einstein founded the International Rescue Committee, the organization that I'm privileged to lead. And so that focus on solutions speaks to the history of our organization. It's one that we try and take forward every day. And we take courage and inspiration from the extraordinary clients that we serve. While they still have hope, what right do we have to give up? David, this show is the road to a vaccine. And so I, I have to ask you this question that, that Francis from LinkedIn is asking. It's great to know what J&J &J is doing, but how can we ensure the vaccine gets to all populations globally? Please go to this to our website, rescue.org, because there you'll see our five-point plan for what we and we think the rest of the humanitarian sector has to do in respect of the COVID crisis. Yes, we have to do the prevention. Yes, we have to do the primary care. Yes, we have to deal with the collateral damage, especially for women and girls who are doubly and trebly affected by this crisis. Yes, we have to do the program adaptation that I mentioned. But I'm so glad to get the chance to say the fifth part of our plan, of our argument, is that the vaccine has to reach the last 10 miles. And it's the last 10 miles that we deal with. I'm excited by the work that's being done by Gavi, uh, the Global Alliance on Vaccines. Uh, the Gates Foundation, I think, has said that they should be the primary um, holding pen, the primary um, uh, bucket, the primary hopper into which money goes to help fund the vaccine. Uh, but it also has to be distributed right. And the distribution mechanisms can't just rely on government systems. They have to rely on the non-governmental organizations. 45% of the world's extreme poor now live in fragile and conflict states where the writ of government doesn't run. And so the voice of the private sector, as well as the voice of the people who are citizens, need to be heard in saying this vaccine has to be globally distributed, otherwise we won't quash the disease. David Miliband of IRC, thank you so much for that vital information. Thank you for doing God's work. Now, in case you're just joining us, this is The Road to a Vaccine, a weekly exploration of the COVID-19 crisis and the global community's efforts to develop a vaccine against the disease. Now, this part of the show is what we call Vaccines 101, and we talk about the fundamentals of vaccines uh, from leading sources and scientists. And today we have a very special treat. Dr. Paul Stoffels, J&J's Chief Scientific Officer, and Dr. Paul Piot, Director of the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, uh, are joining us today. Both men have spent the last few decades hunting viruses. They become good friends in the process, and now they are both battling COVID. Dr. Stoffels leads the team of J&J scientists developing a vaccine, and while also working on solutions to COVID, Dr. Paul Piot found himself fighting the disease as a patient. I spoke to them both earlier. 
So you two are considered legends in the battles against Ebola and AIDS, and you've spent 30 years on the front lines, often together. Dr. Stoffels, what does it mean to be a virus hunter, and in what ways have the two of you collaborated? <laughs> Well, uh, Lisa, we are mainly the virus fighters. Yeah? Uh, when we found a virus like HIV, Ebola, Zika, um, RSV, we have been uh, always uh, trying to focus on, on how can we first treat and or uh, prevent. And uh, we were often faster by being able to treat uh, virus diseases than prevent because vaccine development takes a long time. But it's very exciting to be able to have technology to prevent a very important disease in the world and prevent epidemics and pandemics from happening. Uh, so it's a fascinating, fascinating career on, on fighting diseases. And can you tell me the ways in which the two of you have collaborated with one another? Yes, um, uh, Peter, uh, uh, when I was young, he was my professor. So I, he was, uh, I had to do exams <laughs> with him a time ago. Uh, and so that's where uh, not collaboration starts, but uh, that's where I got to know Peter. And then we started to work in the early days of HIV in Congo back in 87, 88, when we both uh, often uh, visited Congo, but uh, started to work on what we do to combat HIV in the very early days. Dr. Piet, what kind of student was Dr. Stoffels? Uh, he was different from the rest, uh, and that's because he always uh, wanted to uh, you know, to have an impact to not just to study, but uh, to make sure that uh, uh, it, uh, you know, there were results and that uh, it was very curious, high degree of curiosity. And let's not forget that curiosity is the mother of science, but is also the mother of innovation and is the mother of uh, solutions. And uh, that's what I remember from the, you know, from the very early days. And Dr. Piet, as virus hunters, how often have you gone into hot zones and, and, and are actually exposed to viruses? Well, I mean, there are viruses and viruses. I mean, there is the, uh, let's say the Ebola type uh, of uh, uh, outbreaks. And that was, uh, that was my baptism of fire in uh, 1976 when I was 27 years old and uh, went for the first time in my life to Africa and first time to uh, investigate an epidemic. And that was uh, the first Ebola outbreak that we know of. Yeah, we, uh, we started to collaborate in uh, uh, 2014 when the West Africa epidemic broke out. We accelerated the development of an Ebola vaccine and jointly with Peter, we started a large clinical trial in uh, setting up a clinical trial in Sierra Leone. Leone. Uh, uh, which wasn't an easy, uh, an easy situation. In the middle of the outbreak, uh, Peter mobilized a very large team going into uh, Sierra Leone and started doing a, a late-stage clinical trial to study efficacy. I think it, it illustrates the power of collaboration, but you have to do this under enormously constrained conditions. As Paul said, um, we set up a um, vaccine uh, clinical trials team uh, in a country in Sierra Leone that had never done a, uh, you know, a randomized controlled trial, a, a proper trial that would lead to, um, you know, to license of a, of a product, um, and that in the middle of a, an epidemic. So, but we now had, you know, we trained people, and there is a really good uh, capacity. Dr. Piat, you've gotten the better of viruses for so long. Um, going back to your, your time in, your, in, in the battle against Ebola. But how are you doing now? Because I, I understand you are currently dealing with COVID yourself. You are a COVID patient. How are you feeling? I'm feeling much better than a few weeks ago, that's for sure. And uh, the irony is that uh, after having tried to make uh, the life of viruses as miserable as possible for them for decades, uh, now a virus... Uh, got me. It was not a great experience in the sense that uh, over two months ago, I uh, started having fever, headache, uh, splitting headache, um, uh, myalgia, so muscle pain and uh, extreme fatigue. And um, uh, I'm still not fully recovered. And uh, uh, I was hospitalized because I needed oxygen. And um, people tend to think that with COVID-19, 
that uh, okay uh, most people get uh, a bit of a flu-like syndrome um, with a fever and so on many are asymptomatic the reality is far more uh, complex um, because there is a um, not insignificant um, proportion of those who get infected um, who will either end up in the hospital or at least will have a prolonged uh, uh, you know, disease uh, progression. But what happened after I was discharged from the hospital is that um, after initial improvement, I uh, gradually developed shortness of breath, which ironically I'd never had before, even if my oxygen saturation levels were pretty low when that's why I was admitted. I was uh, 84 percent when I was admitted to the hospital. Um, but then what happened in my case, and, and, uh, and it's now increasingly clear that this is happening to uh, lots of people, um, I developed a, some kind of inflammatory pneumonia. Um, I know that my lungs are full of lymphocytes, and uh, uh, they're a good thing. I mean, that's, uh, we need our immune system to, you know, to get rid of, of viruses. That's what we try to mimic with vaccines. Um, but when they're overdoing it, um, you're also into trouble. Dr. Stoffels, when you found out that your friend and professor, someone you have spent so much time in the field with, had contracted COVID, what was going through your mind? I was very concerned. Um, I knew how bad it could go, and I uh, followed up with Peter's wife every day to hear how it was going and uh, try to follow very closely to see when uh, you are if I could help in one or another way, but of course, Peter in the UK with a, and there in the healthcare system, they're helping him very well. So it was a, it was a stressful, uh, stressful time for me because I was very, very concerned. Uh, but it's a big lesson for everybody. Uh, don't take this lightly. Um, we are still in the middle of this pandemic and we are now starting to release uh, the rules. Um, uh, don't uh, better protect yourself than so feel sorry afterwards because this is not a simple disease and we have to get through this before we can uh, get back to full comfort uh, uh, and normal living again so um, that's why all of us um, peter is again fully involved in the COVID 19 um, um, uh, work on, on developing vaccines and advising and collaborating we are working together again on making sure as fast as possible we can uh, prevent people from getting the disease but also accelerate therapies because a lot of, like Peter saying, therapies are necessary. And uh, the whole world is, the whole scientific medical world is working on this. And this is where science, innovation, and a development of new tools of therapeutics and vaccines is going to be essential to um, end this kind of crisis situation, which may go on for uh, quite a while. But the biggest mistake today would be to, uh, to get compliance complacent and uh, to uh, you know to relax too early um, I'm not saying that this lockdown should continue forever definitely not but we uh, when I see people here in London uh, taking the tube um, going to parks uh, you know without any protection any uh, you know mask and so on then I say oh my dear we're going to get into deep trouble and we'll we'll go for a second wave and there will be some more waves, the second wave and so on, but let's make sure, um, you know, it kills far fewer people than now. And uh, that's why the development of a vaccine is such a, uh, an, an urgency. Dr. Stoffels, you're in Belgium and Dr. Piet is in England. You haven't seen him in a while. How do you think he looks? Well, I think mean, it's uh, uh, still looks a little bit more tired. He's always uh, a very vital person from the morning to the evening. Uh, and he still looks a little tired, so I advise him all the time, Peter, take your time to recover. We need Peter with his strong voice in the world to continue to fight for the people all over the world, not just for the West, but Peter has always been a fighter for the poorest in the world, and I very much respect that. Dr. Piet, are you, are you heeding uh, Dr. Stoffel's advice and, and, and taking the time to recover? I mean, there's so much going on right now. There literally is this... this um, this race to develop a vaccine. Are you taking the time that you need to take care of yourself? 
I always take very seriously what Paul says because he's a he's a wise man and he also has experience of many things. But I'll have to accept that uh, uh, I can't do everything, and uh, unfortunately, there are uh, far more people today engaged in um, fighting epidemics in in, uh, in global health than um, when Paul and I started. Uh, we were very very few. We knew all each other. Today, uh, and that is thanks also to, um, you know, these epidemics that have been there in the past. Many come from the dealing with the with, with HIV, the AIDS movement, I would say, um, with Ebola. So that that that's a, uh, for me a, a very important difference with before. And uh, I know, and lots of young people. Uh, the, the field has attracted a lot of bright young people, scientists, clinicians uh, of all kinds. Uh, it has motivated, uh, you know, individuals, uh, be it in companies uh, like J and J and other companies, but also in in academia, and that makes me uh, feel, uh, how to say, a bit better. But I'm the kind of person I feel guilty if I can't contribute uh, enough. But I'll I'll listen to my good friend Paul, and uh, after this interview, I'm going to take a rest. <laughs> I'm I'm glad to hear that. Um, both of you are, are so renowned um, in, in your industry and in what you do. How would you both describe this period, this moment in science? Well, it's, it's bringing all experience from the last 30 years together in order to get in a very compact time a, a solution for this. And I'm very happy, no, I never am happy that, that, that there is a virus, but we learned a lot from, from HIV, we learned a lot from Ebola, from Zika, we learned from um, all, all the diseases on how to tackle them. And the science has evolved so fast, the platforms now are there to do it. And why can we do it probably in a year's time now? It's because of all that experience. And I'm very happy that we did it, and we did it for... Uh, we did of the last 30 years for the benefit of the world for people living with very serious diseases but now it's a real global pandemic which is front and center for everybody and hopefully that that expertise now and experience will uh, result very quickly in, in hopefully good vaccines and a, even drugs to uh, to combat this very bad uh, and very sad period in history yeah we're not starting from scratch uh, as paul said uh, you know, we've accumulated a lot of uh, knowledge, particularly in how to work together, what to do, how to deploy, uh, you know, the science and, uh, and and mobilize companies. But that requires uh, the kind of leadership that uh, that Paul is uh, providing to not only within the company, but to the world. Um, but on the other hand, the challenge is we, we're all uh, rushing into developing a vaccine, um, but the number of uncertainties uh, even on terms of uh, whether uh, immune protection is possible for how long, uh, is they're still there. So we have to to put this uh, plane together while we're flying. Um, but on the other hand, again, uh, we are not starting from scratch. And that is really, really important. If this would have happened uh, 20, 30 years ago, I don't think we would have been able to uh, to move that fast. This is a vaccine that will have to be given to billions of people. We're not talking about millions, but billions. And Paul knows this much, much better than I do that the challenges of, uh, you know, manufacturing and so on, but it means that it has to be absolutely safe. Again, we cannot take shortcuts. So uh, it's going to be um, the, uh, we need the best of all worlds where we need to uh, waste absolutely no time, no time to lose, as my memoirs say, um, and and not uh, not one day should be lost uh, because of inefficiencies. On the other hand, also uh, we need to make sure that we have the best possible product uh, based on solid science and solid uh, quality of uh, uh, of the vaccine and and therapeutics. Peter, I, I just want to, uh, to tell you that a few phone calls uh, or the several phone calls we made and you made uh, on, on how to uh, accelerate and, and um, the vaccine development in, in the European and in the world have already helped a lot. So 
is the uh, is the connection you make with uh, make with the top people in the world who uh, who who you're a lot of big influencer on will really make it are really making the difference and uh, your no nonsense approach uh, already since thirty years is is helping in the world uh, is uh, that's uh, thank well, you for that. No, no, I think we have that in common. I mean, that's uh, uh, I'm interested in. Um, you know, saving lives, but also um, I really hate it when um, people for some, let's say, bureaucratic reasons or for uh, whatever they, because of their own interest that they, they slow down uh, the, if it's the development of a vaccine or for providing access uh, to life-saving drugs for, uh, you know, people with HIV. Um, and that's, I think, where we, uh, uh, we're a good team, I think, you know, and uh, uh, that's also one of the advantages of being old, you know, 71, I, I've met lots of people and, um, you know, I, I know more or less how the world functions uh, sometimes. Um, but I think this is such a huge challenge that we need to, to join forces. And uh, uh, even if today we can't travel and so on, there is a phone and we, we talk regularly. But also, Paul, yeah. it has been a, a good, um, um, yeah, moral, emotional support to me. Uh, you know, our calls that uh, you put things in perspective, um, uh, both in terms of the, of the disease, but also uh, what can be done. And, and it's not over, so we still have a long way to go. So many more phone calls. And, then, and what's yeah. important also, uh, when uh, it will be legal again, we'll you know, we'll get together and, and, and have some fun over a good meal. Well, and a good glass of wine, Peter. Looking forward to that one. Mm -hmm. Yes, indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much to Dr. Paul Stoffels and Dr. Peter Piot, uh, whom I in inadvertently called Paul when I introduced him. Uh, these two men are such exceptional scientists with such an exceptional friendship. Uh, we are back live on the road to a vaccine and while vaccines are being developed and we try to manage our lives amidst everything that's going on, there is so much good happening in the world. People are going above and beyond to help each other, including our healthcare heroes who continue to put themselves on the line. We talked to a few young voices to find out what they had to say. Hello everyone. Hi. We are the authors of Granddad Mandela. I want to say thank you to all the doctors and nurses out there. They're protecting us during the virus while we stay home. Not just in the coronavirus, they always help. Thank you for keeping us safe. For risking your lives to make ours better. Um, I know your job is hard and I just want to say thank you. I want to give doctors, nurses, in general, a big thank you hug. For your bravery, courage, and time supporting us during this tough time fighting against the disease COVID-19. Thank you, doctors and nurses, for your determination, especially to Uncle Harvey! Thank you to all those healthcare workers. My parents work in healthcare at a nursing home. They work hard to keep me and my brother safe. They risk their lives for saving other people, and that's really nice of them. When I grow up, I want to be a doctor and save people that are sick. I would like to be a scientist to save lives and keep people safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Bye. I don't know about you, but I needed to hear those voices and see those faces. This show has been all about following the road to a vaccine, and we've learned so much, but there's still so much we don't know. Will reopening result in a second wave? What treatments are safe and actually work? How long will it take to reach herd immunity? Will SARS-CoV-2 become a seasonal virus? How will clinical trials pan out, and when will a vaccine be available? For the next few weeks, we will be taking a short break to continue preparing world-renowned guests and segments, and we'll return live on Tuesday, July 7th. 
In the meantime, we will continue to share new content and keep you up to date on any new developments. Again, this program is about giving you access to the experts. So keep submitting your questions and also let us know what you'd like to see on future episodes of the show. As Dr. Peter Piat said earlier, there is no time to lose. Not one day should be lost. And that is why we are continuing down the road. I wanna personally thank the men and women out there working on the front lines, including in health departments, labs, and hospitals. Whether you are a delivery worker or a stay-at-home mom or an emergency room physician or nurse, we all have a role in this pandemic. And it's when we come together that we are stronger. The road continues. We don't know how long it will be, but I am confident we will get there. We'll see you very soon.